Welcome to Euro PCR 2019. Welcome to this wrap up on renal innovation. It's great to have two colleagues and friends with me, Roland Schmieder from Germany and Flavio Ribicchini from Italy. So we had an interesting session here at Euro PCR about renal innovation and we want to summarize what we have learned these days. It's a year since we have presented and published the most recent sham control trials on renal innovation. And I would love to get your thoughts about the future, what we have learned, where we are moving. So Flavio, why don't we start a bit about talking a bit about the foundation of renal innovation, where we are coming from, and also what has changed with respect to the procedure? Talking about the future requires remembering also the past. Where That's we a come good point, from. yeah. So renal innovation with transcatheter therapy, it's a very modern and promising therapy, but it's not a new concept. Actually, sympathectomy performed by surgery, it's a very, very old technique. It was developed in the 30s of the last century and clinically used during the 40s and the 50s. Because probably we don't, we don't remind this, we were not born, but there were no anti-hypertensive medications at that time. And for very highly hypertensive patients, surgery was the only option with a very invasive surgery, which was quite effective, not effective in all cases, but that was everything that they could do at that time. Following this concept, the transcatheter therapy is inducing a disruption of this nervous drive in the sympathetic system with the use of catheters. In the latest chair, the catheters have evolved from a single monopole catheter to the actual catheter, which has four electrodes that distribute homogeneously at 360 degrees along the artery wall. So this has been a big change in the technology that we have been using in the last years. Not only the technology changed, also the approach <coughs> to real innovation changed, right? Of course, we learned how to do it slowly. The approach now is uh, more, I'd say, dedicated. We have learned that these uh, nerves are closer to the artery. The farther you go from the origin of the artery, the more distal you go. In the bifurcation, bifurcation of the artery, it's a very good target for treatment. So this is what happened. We go farther, we go to the bifurcations, and we apply more energy in these four electrodes compared to the first techniques that we use during the first large randomized hypertension 3 trial. Any concerns about safety with this <coughs> revised approach? Well, um, I have been doing procedures for nearly seven years, and so far we have not seen what could be important, which is... Uh, stenosis of the artery, dissections of the artery, and what is even more frequent would be a reduction in the glomerular filtration rate. So, so far, even in the studies with large number of patients, there is no evidence of harm of the vessel translating into, yeah. steno into stenosis or dissections. And what is very, very rewarding is that the renal function at the long term in those patients that start with a depressed GFR actually improves or don't get worse, which is a very important it's safety important, issue. Yeah, yeah, observation. We had a presentation here at Europe <coughs> PCR about the Global Simplicity Registry, which is indeed the largest real world database that is available, almost 3,000 patients included, follow up to three years, no vascular safety events that popped up in this registry, no renal function events that were, you know, concerning. And we have documented blood pressure following of these patients treated in the registry in different subgroups, diabetics, elderly patients, patients with resistant, so-called resistant hypertension. So I guess that was an important observation. But Roland, do you want to talk about patient preference as this is one of the most evolving concepts in new trial designs that we're talking now with renal innovation? You know, we have proven yeah. that these yeah. technology lower blood pressure. We also want to touch upon the clinical meaning of the blood pressure reductions that we observe, but I think the, the next step in the evaluation is that we have to incorporate patient preference also in the study designs. I think that's an important issue. Actually, in the last years, we had a learning curve. First, we learned that patients do not exactly what we, what we want that they should do. We learned about non-adherence, and even studies, we have some kind of non-adherence just 
reflecting that the patient does not always say what the doctor wants that the patient should do. And from that on, the patient comes into the center. And we then went to our, our approach to say, well, what about the preference? What is the patient really thinking about? Which therapy is for him the right one? And having that in mind, we did a survey on our patient preference in more than 1,000 hypertensive patients who just entered the GP and cardiology offices without what the reason for that. And it turned out, and I think that's an important number, that approximately 25 to 31 percent have the preference for real innovation instead of taking a drug or adding another drug in order to control blood pressure. Patients are concerned that they really want to have their blood pressure controlled. But the point is, of course, patients have their own ideas and their own perception what for them is most suitable. And patients who had one, two or three drugs, like in the spiral on trial, now these kind of patients... Can you remind us what spiral on means? So yeah. which patients were investigated yeah. then? The spiral on have, is a, a sham controlled, double blind, a blinded, randomized yeah. trial in patients oh. who have on one, two or three drugs. So that's reflecting the hypertensive uh, disease in general practice. And when you ask these patients, this group of patients, what they want to prefer, so 28% that we want an intervention strategy, once a time treatment, not a lifelong drug therapy, which reminds them every day that they have a chronic disease, that they have to take a tablet. And I think that's an important number at the end. Yeah. So this is not, have not been reflected so far mm. and should enter daily clinical practice. In the discussion with our patients, what is, what is the expected blood pressure fall uh, when it comes to real innovation? So what should we put on the table when you know, discussing device-based approaches and when it comes to patient preference? So what should they expect and what should the colleagues who watch this video here now tell our patients? 10, 15, 20, what's the numbers that they should expect? Well, patients always have high expectation, but I think the colleagues should start first. The reduction by an antihypertensive drug is about 7 to 10 millimeter mercury. And with the real innovation, we have a fall of 11, 10 millimeter mercury in office blood pressure readings. That's what for the patient important because he measures his blood pressure as well. So this 10 millimeter mercury is a real number we can tell the patient this is the average fall in blood pressure. And it is equivalent to 1 to 1.5 antihypertensive drug effect. And that, I think, is uh, good information for the patient that he has come to an own decision whether he wants interventional techniques or whether he wants to have an additional drug. But this is the future. We are just on that track. Yeah. A few words about the future. So what's next then? Well, uh, I think a good starting point could be patient education. Mm -hmm. Because patient comes with expectations saying, I mean, I need to lower my blood pressure, but I, it's not clear for them what does this mean. A reduction of 10 millimeters of mercury, which may, be, may see something easy to obtain or, or irrelevant, reduces the risk of stroke, death, and infarction by a, a huge number of percentage. So it is very important that patients become aware of the need of controlling these 10 millimeters of mercury, five millimeters of mercury even have a tremendous impact in survival. This is the first point. Second point is that, as Roland said, many patients don't do what we ask them to do, which is not only taking pills, it is good diet, exercise, style of living, moving. And all these explain why it's so difficult to reduce blood pressure because it's really a complex mm, process multifactorial. with multifactorial. We will act on one of these factors effectively and we will help the patient to control blood pressure, but they still need to take drugs. This is something that should be clear. Hypertension is a medical mm. treatment. Antihypertensive treatment requires pills. The fact is that many times people don't like to take pills, especially young people. Think people of our age, taking a pill in the morning, one in the afternoon, one at the end day, one before going to the gym, one during you are in the work. Diuretics are socially <laughs> hard to accept. And so why not combining the two things? Taking a pill in the morning and one when you go to bed, and during the day you have a well-controlled blood pressure thanks to a single procedure. Invasive, yeah. 
invasive procedure. Yeah. We are not scared of that. This is our job. But offering the patient the certainty mm. that his blood pressure will be controlled. Coming back to the first point, reducing the risk of having stroke, infarction, and sudden death. Good points. Yeah. Roland, patient selection in future studies, where are we going to and how do these studies look like and when can we expect the results? Well, the results, I think next year we have more results and hopefully we can also maybe predict which of our patients respond best. Yeah. This has nothing to do with preference, but I think if we can tell you you have maybe even 50 meter mercury decrease, I think this is something really which for the patient is important, as just has been elucidated. I think we also should go for a acceptance of the lower blood pressure goals. And if you go to 130 over 80 and below, as now recommended by US, by European, by all national guidelines, we need all tools we have to, con to get to blood pressure control. This means not only just lifestyle changes, going to the gym and so on, or applying single fixed combinations with drug therapy. Combination. We need mm. a third pillar. Mm. And I think this really will the establishment of interventional therapy and renal innovation is the most advanced technology in that field as a third pillar of treating our patients. And then also the patient may choose in the first stages, meaning uncontrolled hypertension, that what is he preference, what would he like to choose. And for example, and one thing we should do not forget, patients who are intolerant to drugs, they have a relief if we can offer them a new technology. And patients who really are afraid of taking drugs, there's always some rumors about that certain drugs may, may induce cancer or so. This is something they are That's afraid of debate. and we have yeah. then a new option. And I think this is really the, for the future, which we have most like next year, when we have the new, let's say, generation two randomized sham the control trials. Studies. The pivotal studies. Right. So, Thank you. More patients to yeah. come. More science to be completed. Yeah. Gentlemen, that was a great discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, we learned about the foundation of renal denervation, the procedure, how it has evolved, how we changed the technique and the technology. I learned uh, a lot about the patient preference issue here at PCR, how important it becomes that we involve patient in decision making, not only when it comes to interventions, but also when it comes to treatment of hypertension. And we are looking into the future with further evaluations uh, of renal denervation. So stay tuned. Great having you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Phil.